World War II, and he had a drive-in restaurant called the Park Moor in Montgomery, Alabama. That's 1946, and it was one of the largest drive-in restaurants at, at the time. And it, the pictures shown here were 1946, but it got enlarged to an enormous drive-in restaurant with two movie screens on each end of it, and its own radio station and whatnot. It was quite a complex. So my father started uh, sponsoring stock cars in the Deep South. And then he started buying stock cars, and he had stable stock cars, and I was a young child. And he, he brought me up around dirt tracks and asphalt tracks, and I see I was attracted to motorcycles and uh, modified sportsman stock cars. He started nagging my dad about getting me a 34 Ford Coupe, and I worked on him and worked on him. And eventually he had one of the stock car drivers pick me up a 34 Ford 500 Coupe out of uh, uh, Mobile, Alabama. So then I got my car. Now, uh, I, I was 12 years old at the time, and I had worked on a farm earlier than that, and I knew how to drive tractors. So I, I could drive the car back on dirt roads and whatnot. I was certainly driving it illegal. You know, I would certainly not want to be an example to young folks. <laughs> I got in an awful lot of trouble. Uh, well, one of my indulgences that cost me a lot of problems was motorcycles, hot rods, and women, young girls. Motorcycles, uh, I, I rode Indian motorcycles, 57 and 58, American Indians, and Royal Enfield Indians. I, I put in what was called at the time sheet time. I put in my sheet time in the hospital, and I was never once in a while in court. I think in my circle of hot rod motorcycle friends, my motorcycle friend circles, there was one set of crutches, and that set of crutches was in continual use. And I, I lost a, a some friends in the motorcycle world, and I decided to go back to uh, hot rods. Then I got to thinking, well, you know, I've been in trouble with the police, and you know, went from job to job. And I worked at the carnival for a while, and all these things. Well, you know, the only thing I could really do good is I had a propensity for craftsmanship. I thought, I better straighten myself up. I had a little money, so I went to California, become a gentleman, and I went from being really a flunky to getting on the, uh, nominated for the Dean's List at Los Angeles City College, and I've become the, the, the school college cartoonist today. Thanks for looking good for me. Okay, I'm at Ross, and uh, you know, I originally intended to have nothing to do with cars, and I'm sitting next to Jim Jacobs, all day, and Jake's talking cars, and he's talking cars, and it's just still and I'm trying to be above it. So one day I talked to Jake, I said, hey, you know, if you, if you ever come across a 32 Ford Roadster body, I said, let me know, okay? Back then, back in the 60s, you could get that stuff. So every day I'd ask Jake, I just want the Roadster body, not a coupe with the top sawed off, and not a, not a Cabriolet. And one morning I come in there and he says, get your checkbook, I got one at Seal Beach, $200. So I went down there, and he says, I went down there, and here is this beautiful body, unchatted, just incredible with the frame and the rear end and the pink slip and the windshield, the original seats, 200 bucks. Talking with Pete Shapiris, he said, well, you know, uh, Pete Eastwood might be tearing that coupe, coupe apart, he might have that frame available. So I said, well, you know, I might be interested in that chassis. That's a roll of chassis. He said, well, listen, you do a couple of t-shirt designs for me, and I'll get you that chassis. So he was going to tear apart this free one to coop, and I was going to get the chassis and whatnot. And there was a party to tear that car down. I guess maybe 45, 50 people come to that party. It's like about 105, 160 degrees. Everybody's getting really drunk. I mean, really, really drunk. So the only people that would go out and work on that car and tear it apart was Pete Eastwood and Suzanne and maybe someone else. I, I, I could I run out there for a while and get hot and come back in the garage. Everyone else was in the garage just drinking beer. So they tore that coupe apart and I got my chassis. So then I run across a guy. There was a head motor pool at the Carnation Milk Company trying to charge all the milk trucks. So he says, bring that chassis over. We'll put that car together. So I drug the body over the chassis and bought a car for the engine. And I had to run a 
Richard Ford Roadster. So, uh, now, there, there is a point. Now, now that I've dominated the conversation, I might, throw, I might throw this egotistical situation in there. If you were back in 81, 82, and you had a primer car, and you drove that primer car around, you had better tell people that it's in progress. This thing is in progress. This is not a finished car. Well, Pete Shapiro said, you know, we'll help you get this roadster running, but we want you to promise that there's still, on the streets of Los Angeles, one primer 32 roadster. I said, you've got a deal. So, uh, it might be hard to swallow, but that is your first rat rod. That, now, Petey's would come out about six months later on the cover of Hot Rod magazine with a sedan, the Bearcat sedan. So he was right behind me. But I do claim that honor. So. <laughs> okay, uh, to, to talk about Roth and Von Dutch. Now, <clears throat> I knew Von Dutch fairly well. Uh, well enough that uh, I could probably challenge anyone's comments about him. He was my childhood hero, and I just worshipped him, and he set an example for not only me, but a lot of young people and young artists. He was enormously imaginative, unbelievable amount of inner energy and aggressive energy. He, he pretty much come up with uh, abstract pinstriping. Now, pinstriping had been around since the Middle Ages as part and parcel of sign painting, but it was Von Dutch that took it to an abstract level of where it's just going wild. I will have to mention the Bohemian factor in this. Uh, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, there was a slew of movies, Bell, Book, and Candle, and The Beat Generation, and a whole, a whole bunch of movies and things related to beatniks. And Von Dutch was part and parcel of this suburban trend. But he kind of picked up this, this social Bohemia the same part and parcel as Ed Roth picked up was kind of like a, an affectation, a hip bohemian beatnik thing. I, I mean, I, I can't imagine Von Dutch sitting down and reading On the Road by Jack Kerouac or any things like that. And I, I don't think he quite caught the intellectuality and the literary part of the bohemian world. They style themselves as like these art, artistic types. You know, there's just like a uh, this prototypical kind of artist thing that you would think of an artist, you know, and it was kind of, it was interesting to me, it was very interesting, and uh, I was kind of fascinated by this, like this almost beatnik, this theatrical kind of beatnik thing that Von Dutch and these people were in, and uh, the, the thing about being a, a, a bohemian is you, you conduct yourself anywhere you want, so you, you got that excuse. I, I don't know how to phrase this properly, but Von Dutch got really nasty, and he was without question mentally ill. There's uh, an entire society of pinstripers today that worship Von Dutch. They would not appreciate what I'm saying, but uh, you, you, you don't find any of them really knew Von Dutch. Von Dutch would throw fits. He'd go into a state of mental illness, and he called it going Tasmanian. And when he went Tasmanian, he left the room because he went he went insane, and he loved he loved to go Tasmanian at exactly the worst time. So like when the worst time was available, he would go Tasmanian. Like he would go into a biker bar and he'd look them all over, look at all the bikers in there, and he'd get up on the bar and start calling them down for their costumes until someone would reach up there and jerk him down and beat him to submission. So about twice a year, Von Dutch received a, a real licking, a, a real bad licking. Now, you know, I. I got to be real good friends with him. We drank a lot of beer. I discussed a lot of art with him. I discussed World War I airplanes. I discussed the machinery. How did this work? How did that work? What kind of motorcycle was that? How did that function? It, it, we'd be up drinking beer till the sun come up over to our house. And he, he, he was just a, an endless source of information. But everyone said, hey, you know, watch out for him. Watch out for him. He's, he's going to go insane on you. And I go, oh, no, no, he's my buddy. But, well, he went to Tasmanian on me. <laughs> he went to Tasmanian. That comic had a revenge history. And that was in 1954. There was a book come out called Seduction of the Inno Innocence by a guy named Dr. Wortham that said comic books, and this book led to juvenile delinquency, and this was a bestseller. 
So they outlawed a lot of comic books. In fact, the best comic books disappeared. So you're left with little happy animal comics and you know Bible comics and uh, history comics and stuff like the real great comics done that were stories by Ray Bradbury and the real great uh, graphic literature, which was the forefathers of what we see now. You know, was outlawed. So the, there was always like this sense of revenge, like a, you think that was a problem, pal. You ain't seen nothing yet. So they went, we, the Zap pulled out all the stops, and it, it was not meant to be prurient pornography, but it didn't shy away from anything profane. So it wasn't like the kind of thing that you could get yourself sexually excited over because it was too ridiculous. But it was, <laughs> but it, but it was really far out, and it, it, it went on for years and years and years. And some of those copies of Zap sold over a million. So then come the punk rock music movement, and they started having art shows in New York and Los Angeles that were after hours clubs, that were art shows, that were uh, excuses to sell alcohol without a license. So you'd have all these young people coming out at the clubs at night when they were intoxicated and whatnot, and they wanted to stay up another two hours, so they'd go to these after hour clubs that were under the guise of galleries. And this art was like, so flipped out, so way out, and I could fill the bill. I could entertain them at two in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and the, the primary tool I used was gratuitous sex and violence. And I had a, a, an understanding of anatomy and comic book art, and I could uh, turn out an enormous amount of these paintings I call zombie mystery paintings. These things I could paint fast enough to sell them like hotcakes. And I, I, I was licensing them out to rock bands right and left. And then as, as I painted, I tightened up a little more, trying to pull in what I wanted. And it took about 10 years, and I was back to the realism that I wanted, see. And by this time, I had other artists that followed suit. I had maybe 50 or 60 artists in the United States, so we needed a way to express ourselves, art form, art in America. Those magazines would not touch this stuff. So I created Juxtapose Magazine in 94, and it, from the beginning, yeah. started out with uh, 23,000 copies. It just sold remarkably well. And then it went up and up and up. Every year it sold more. It started out as a quarterly, and then it went bi-monthly, and then it went monthly, and it just got more successful. And then all of a sudden, it was a top-selling art magazine on Planet Earth. Yeah. <laughs> now, this painting's called Snuff Fake. They always have an intellectual title, and then they have an everyday title. That's right. That's right, because there's different ways to look at things. There's, a, there's a, the matter-of-fact way to describe it. And then for the, the pedantic academic bunch, I, I flowered up with a real uppity title. <laughs> and then, so I don't miss any of the crowd, I give it a gutter title, you know? <laughs> so you're getting in three directions. Um, sculptures like this, you're getting into the uh, real blue chip world. You're in the upper level of art when you get into things like this. Like this, this is for New York and whatnot. That's a that's the art world kind of material right there. And uh, that's made out of fiberglass and steel. It took me and a crew or two or three months and months to put that together. This kind of stuff has actually poisoned its way into national recognition. Now this painting, this sculpture here. Tell me the title of this one, Robert. Okay, there was an old term back in the 30s and 40s. 50s for something that was overdone or way pretentious. And I heard men say this, man, that's a diamond in a goat's ass. <laughs> Whenever there's automotive stuff, when there's racing stuff, you can bet that Robert's researched it and it's correct. There'll be a monster on the side now, don't get me wrong. I, I can't preach to the choir if they ever not all right, but I can go out and find young people that really don't know about it and try to win them. You know, and that's more important to me. Is pe people think the best things in the world come to your door, they don't. You have to go out and investigate and bring things into your life. Anyway, it will, it very well. I sit before you, a man that makes a living at it. Rare situation.